Okay, we're back, and in this lecture we're going to talk about modulation, which will lead us to talk about some basic transmitter architectures uh, and uh, transmission across the channel from a transmitter to a receiver. So the first question we have is, what is modulation? So the general definition of modulation that we'll be using is a process by which an information-bearing signal is modified and superimposed on another signal. And our focus will be on modulating RF carrier signals. Specifically, what we're talking about is that our focus will be on modulating RF carrier signals or superimposing information on high-frequency carrier waves. So let's assume that our high-frequency carrier is a single-frequency cosine wave that has a time domain equivalence of cosine of 2 pi fc of t. If we do a Fourier transform of this, we'll find that we have two impulse functions that are offset by the carrier frequency and the negative carrier frequency. And we can plot this function. We just have impulses at minus fc and at plus fc, and they have a value of half of the amplitude of the time domain waveform. So now let's examine our modulating signal. So our modulating signal is an analog or digital signal that carries information, and it's usually low pass with a signal bandwidth that's much, much less than the carrier frequency. So let's imagine that our modulating signal is X of M, and we're looking at this in the frequency domain. And it has some shape like this. It has a bandwidth from minus bandwidth over 2 to plus bandwidth over 2. And we're going to try and superimpose this on a carrier. So in the time domain, what we're doing is multiplying our carrier wave, xc of t, times our modulating wave, xm of t. Nominally, we have xm of t times the cosine of 2 pi fc of t. Now, the multiplication in the time domain, time domain means that we have a convolution in the frequency domain. So our information is going to be superimposed on the carrier. And if we look at this in the time domain, uh, if we look at this in the frequency domain, our spectrum after modulation is as follows. We have our modulating waveform centered at frequency plus FC and minus FC, and the bandwidth stays the same as it was before the modulation. For bandpass signals, we can modulate either in the amplitude or phase domain or both. So we can represent this modulation of amplitude, phase, or both in the polar domain. We would say that our modulating signal xm of t is equal to some a of t times cosine of 2 pi fc of t plus phi of t. Let's talk about what a of t and phi of t are. So a of t is the instantaneous amplitude modulation and phi of t is the instantaneous phase modulation. And these represent information that we might be trying to transmit across the channel. And note that I had made a mistake earlier. We're talking about our signal after modulation. So I took away the, uh, the subscript M. We can of course also represent this polar vector in the Cartesian domain as Cartesian modulation. To represent in the Cartesian domain, we can do transformations from the polar domain or vice versa. We can represent polar domain as transformations from the Cartesian domain. 
So our Cartesian signals are x sub i of t and x sub q of t, and this represents an in-phase and a quadrature vector. Generally, we can derive transmitters for each domain. So we'll first begin by talking about a Cartesian transmitter, as this is the more common transmitter architecture that's used. So in the Cartesian transmitter, we have two orthogonal vectors, x i and x q, that are independently translated up to a high frequency, and then they are summed and amplified. Now, it's critical that the mixers themselves don't have very much feed through and that they're balanced very well. And additionally, we also need to make sure that if we're amplifying signals that have amplitude modulation, we have a very linear power amplifier. So as I said a moment ago, this requires a linear power amplifier if we're amplifying signals that have amplitude modulation and the mixer is relatively complicated. It's also relatively inefficient energy-wise because the linear power amplifier typically isn't operating near its saturated output power where it's most efficient, but is operating in a back-off power. So it's inefficient, but it's relatively easy to design because we know how to design all these parts very well. Okay, so next we're going to look at the polar transmitter. So in a polar transmitter, we have our amplitude modulation that we use to modulate a linear DC to DC converter. This can be a series regulator, sometimes called an LDO or low dropout regulator. And we have our phase signal driving a phase modulator. And this can be uh, something like a PLL, uh, or it could uh, be the mixer uh, from the Cartesian modulator that we saw on the previous page. This is driving a power amplifier, and importantly, this power amplifier doesn't have to be linear. So conceptually, this is actually easier than uh, Cartesian modulation. The power amplifier is effectively just doing a multiplication of the amplitude and phase. So part of the reason that this is a bit more challenging is that the blocks for the DC to DC converter and phase modulator are more challenging to design, particularly for wideband signals. And we won't talk about why right now, but just keep that in the back of your mind. The power amplifier can be more efficient because we can keep it closer to, to its saturated output power, uh, but and it can also be nonlinear, uh, and that means that it can be a switched mode power amplifier. Finally, we should note that the signal transformation between Cartesian and polar can be cumbersome. And most DSPs work in the Cartesian domain, which means that we have to do, to do the transformation from Cartesian to polar, which results in wideband signals and, res, and results in the use of something that's called a cortic, which is a coordinate rotation digital uh, integrated computer. Okay, so we're going to stop there for this lecture, uh, but we'll note that uh, we'll look into more of the details of both of these architectures as we go along in the course. And I think I'm going to hold off on talking about the Fries equation until uh, tomorrow.